Hello and welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. My guest today is Harpreet Singh, co-founder and co-CEO of Launchable, a company that leverages AI and machine learning to accelerate development. And I know there's a bit more around that. You're going to get into that, but welcome, Harpreet. Thank you for having me here, Christian. It's great to have you. It's always good to talk to people from the Bay Area as well, as I've often talked about, you know, born and raised. I like knowing where stuff is. It's great to go back and visit. But uh, <laughs> like everything, I go back and my childhood neighborhoods are looking very different. <laughs> that is, yes, Bay Area has changed. Um, I'm born and brought up in Mumbai, but I think I was always a Bay Area person at heart. And when I landed here, I realized, oh, this is this is home. A home's changed in the last 20, 25 years that I've been here. It's uh, quite quite a place. Yeah. It Nothing is a, like it anywhere. Uh, it's an incredible place. I say that years ago, I, I so a few years back, I worked with, uh, was with a company. We got acquired by a company out of Boston. And while the accent was different, I think a lot of the work culture was very fast paced. Um, I'd say mm. uh, you can be aggressive sometimes in the Bay, Bay Area, but it's very entrepreneurial. It's very... You know, people that are looking for how can we solve these business problems and turn this mm. idea into something. And uh, I mean, that's very much part of the Bay Area culture that I loved. Absolutely. I, I tell this to my nephews and nieces who are like back in India is like what makes Bay Area special. And it's it's really this this notion that you pointed out. I have an itch. I'm going to scratch it. Right. I'm going to go fix it. I'm not going to wait for somebody else to fix it. And that, I think that's really the, the heart of the area. Yeah. It's also, I, I say, I'm very involved on the community side of things with, mm. um, you know, user groups. And uh, I used to go to a ton of networking events and being a, a former startup founder, launch events and pitching to VCs and angel groups and all of those and just networking with those, those folks. Again, it just, uh, that's something that, uh, you know, it, it's just a you know high energy location part of the world in general, but it's yeah, absolutely. It, if you're going to start a company, I mean, there's not, it's one of the best places to be built out of from based in, uh, in the world, but uh, absolutely. tell us about Launchable. So who are you guys? What do you guys do? Um, so uh, we are a AI slash machine learning company that focuses on of the software test triaging workflow process. Um, now there's a number of things that we do, uh, but where we started off with was from this place of like, your tests take too long and 80% of your tests are pointless. You know, uh, for every commit that's coming in, you don't need to test everything, but you're doing it anyways. And we started looking at this problem and said, like, can machine learning help? And so what we could do is we could look at code changes that are coming in and a bunch of other signals and predict which tests are likely to fail and straight up go to the tests that are likely to fail and execute them. Right? And so the idea started on how can we shrink down this dev test workflow process? How can we help, you know, engineering and quality teams iterate faster? And that's where we started off with. And in our journey, we discovered a bunch of other things as startups do, and we built a bunch of other things and are in the process of building a bunch of other things, which you know, we talked about. Well, this, yeah, the topic for folks, uh, it's building a next-gen DevOps practice, strategies for accelerating product and software delivery. I think that's a great place to stop. We, as we were chatting before we started recording here, uh, talking about our backgrounds and, uh, and, and things, uh, it's interesting yeah, so we're both old enough to uh, uh, predate the, the the term DevOps, and and so looking at how much has changed since I got involved in the early '90s, um, end up by the end of that decade was I had written a, a, a book and in early 2000s wrote a couple more that were technically in the DevOps space around software configuration mm -hmm. management and 
in engineering and operations, and then of course, working in different operations teams and managing some of the development process. Yeah, there was a lot of room to clean up that end to end process. You know, I, I think like a lot of things too, organizations that can be good at change management in general, if they're good mm -hmm. at the software development process side of things, they're going to out innovate their competitors uh, mm -hmm. that get bogged down in the process. So they can't get out of their own ways to, you know, to, to build things fast enough to out compete. Absolutely. I mean, isn't this sort of the theory that got proved by Amazon, right? It, it started off with like, let's keep pushing things. Let's keep pushing things out and we continuously keep doing it. And uh, I remember about 10 years back, um, before the term continuous delivery came in, I was trying to, you know, convey this, this notion to my customers is like, you should be pushing things out all the time. And then at some point the industry coalesced around the term continuous delivery. And that's really the hypothesis. We push things out very quickly. We we'll iterate, we'll experiment. We learn from it and you know take it from there and definitely you know uh, the results are there to see for organizations that push push things out much faster well i think that's why if you look at like my my background being more on the project and portfolio management side of things that idea of you know the agile organization being able to fail quickly learn from that um and not be afraid to go and uh, even instead of trying to I mean, the old waterfall method of development of, you know, take three, four years and all those features. And by the time you build out and push them live, you're already behind, you know, those, right. those, the more agile startups. And so this idea of, uh, you know, one of the ideas of fewer features, um, but on a regular cycle so that it's, you know, what's ready for, but like, we're pushing this next version out regardless mm -hmm. like let's figure out what's in that so that we can then learn from that and improve and then get back into the next cycle but there are of course yeah. companies in, you know, that are doing that pushing out you know weekly or or even more than that uh, yeah you can't do that unless you have the process down yeah i, I think the you, you mentioned agile as part of it i spent a bit of time at, at locking which primarily led the world with Agile and Jira and, and so on. I think there's, there's this notion of also, I was talking to somebody else, a, a prospect uh, a few days back. It's, uh, it's not a process that gets completely baked. It's not set in stone. The whole notion with Agile is that you are learning as you go and some things might work for this team and may not work for another team, but you're continuously sort of coming back you're looking at it, you're retrospecting and saying, what worked, what didn't, how do I change from there, right? So that notion of continuous learning, I think that's really what organizations, the, the organizations that embrace that are the ones that become successful and like the process originates, you know, as almost as a byproduct of that philosophy. Right? Well, that's what you're seeing that more and more. I mean, uh, it will certainly larger product companies that are, um, you know, the trying to, uh, they, a lot of solutions have moved to the, the, the cloud. You started seeing this where they say, well, we need to deliver these things faster. Again, move away from that waterfall mm -hmm. to that more continuous, that evergreen delivery model. Um, mm -hmm. and, but they were, they were pushing the fact that they were making decisions on which features and, uh, um, and where to, put development resources around, you know, where are we going to get the most impact? So it's data-driven decisions around versus mm -hmm. the, you know, the old days when, you know, that a decision would make or the product or marketers would go and build the strategy and, and build that end. Now it's, it's much easier to look at what are people actually using of, of our features? What are they doing on our site? What, you know, what's right. going to create the biggest impact for the next mm -hmm. version where we get new subscribers, new users, or, uh, uh, or, or, you know, features that extend from the customer, the, the company's perspective, you know, the sales price, our average sales price up you know, by what we right. do. I think you're, you're describing this world of like SaaS, where it naturally leads to this 
experiment based culture and throwing things out and seeing what's happening, who's adopting what. But um, also just to flag this, there's a whole world out there where they're not doing that. And they're not doing that not because they're slow, uh, because they can't, right? So for example, if you're shipping cars, uh, you can't ship it out and you know throw that experiment out and see what's happening. So they tend to have these longer cycles, but what we've seen is within those longer cycles, they have adopted like very agile processes and they are, you know, they don't think of this as a car that releases a few years down the line. They are always looking at this weekly cadence and, you know, that cadence is delivering internally, but they are still having that agile mindset to kind of go, you know, deliver. Well, Another what, place that yeah, I was yeah. going to say, like, what do you what do you see slowing down organizations? Like, what are the what patterns do you see? What like they might again, they might have brilliant ideas and they might be more agile in certain areas, but wh where do you see the primary pain points for organizations? Um, so I'll I'll go with the hypothesis that led me to my company, right? So my background is um, my co-founder uh, created this tool called Jenkins. Right. And this is the number one sort of DevOps software delivery lifecycle pipeline CI tool on which most organizations deliver. I got associated with it because I looked at it and I go like, this is a very nice idea and we should take this to market. And we sort of built a, I was part of a company that took this, you know, to market for CloudBees. And, uh, what I noticed, what we both noticed is we were telling people to go through these DevOps transformations, set up their software delivery life cycles and set up their pipelines. They're doing all the agile stuff, the pipeline, you know, all that stuff is happening, but the bits are not landing fast enough because they are in months long DevOps transformations. And how many times have you heard about DevOps transformation? So what happens is uh, an engineering leader decides this is a great idea. He spends enough political capital to convince the entire organization to go along with it. And then what happens is well, six months down the line, we're still in DevOps transformations and things are moving slowly. So we looked at this problem and said like this notion of this very nice, sexy infinity loop, the continuous delivery infinity loop, you've seen it everywhere. I positioned it to number of clients. I was like, no, that's not quite working. And as we looked into this, we found that like the biggest bottleneck were tests, right? And you think about it, um, every organization is building tests. Right? Tests are the only things that keep on going month after month, year after year. You just can't have enough tests. To date, I've talked with customers who have like thousands of tests and they feel naked that they don't have enough tests, right? And it's almost a tax, right? You've got to run it, you know, that's it, right? And so we looked at this and we went like, well, that is really, it's just a series of tests, you know, gauntlet of test suites that every commit kind of goes through. Something goes wrong, it restarts that whole journey and it goes through again and it restarts that journey. And that is where a whole bunch of friction is. And people just say, we can't do anything about it. And you just step away and you look at other places to go in. So our hypothesis is, can we go about being smart about this? Can we look at, you know, the advances in AI and machine learning and look at the exhaust data that's coming out from your tests and your delivery pipeline? And can we do something about it? That's sort of where we started off with. But our hypothesis is that one of the biggest pain points in the dev test workflow is you know, testing the time it takes. Really long answer to that. Yeah, no, that I, question. I, I mean, that makes perfect sense. I mean, knowing too what, what, what AI is good at is going in and summarizing, identifying patterns and looking at, you know, I'm sure, again, that client that has a thousand or more tests that they're doing, um, I'm sure there's overlap. I'm sure there's redundancy and inefficiencies in that. And so one of the first things it, I mean, I, I would look to do is just like, are, are we, are we doing the right things? Are we doing the right test? Is it optimized for the activity? Absolutely. And that's really, that was really our hypothesis. So you actually call out, you know, two sort of in, insights here uh, to make it explicit for your audience. One is like, 
how many projects you've been on where the test suite was written like you know a couple of years ago but the person who wrote that no longer is here everybody's running it nobody knows why we are running it but everybody is afraid if i pull this out maybe something's going to break right so that's one sort of inefficiency and we actually can you know flag that for people with their data and say like okay these tests have never failed so it's like a cat going you know that never catches a mouse for you so we can flag those things um or the tests that get unhealthy and like you know tests that are flaky they go you know some for the same commit they pass for the same commit they fail and then what ends up happening is devs lose trust in the system and then they start working around it so that's one class of problems and then the second insight that you called out is is really like um you think about it um 80% of your tests are pointless this, this is an intentionally inflammatory statement what i mean by that is not all tests need to be run for every commit that's coming in right and we are running it because we have no way of figuring it out which one is important and that's really where we honed in and we said like okay we can look at all the signals you know the changes coming in the past history of tests the past history of the individual making these changes and then we can say like you know of the 100 tests that you're running these 20 are the ones that will fail let's go and execute that and let's find that failure and instead of waiting for an like an hour or a day find what's going to fail and then react to it and eating valuable time into your agile sprint i can get to it right away right and go fix that and iterate faster and like you know the there is no need for devops transformations because it's just like pushing a turbo button if you're able to do that and that's what you promise now, is this, um, so I know that uh, I have to ask it from this perspective. So no, having known a lot of, you know, S debts in my life and, and a lot of testing, a lot of large companies, Microsoft is a great example that went in and did waves of layoffs of testing folks. Cause the, the idea was that we're going to automate a lot of that. Um, mm -hmm. or, and with that automation, especially now, and this is pre AI wave. And even now with the AI does it replace the need for a lot of the people that own those activities or are we, it, I mean, well, I guess that's a valid question. I mean, like, are, are we <laughs> getting rid of the need for the people there because the tools can do a lot of that work? Um, I don't think so. Um, the way I think about it is, is the workflow is inefficient and the process is inefficient but the process still exists so i truly believe in this notion of uh, the ai copilot which i think microsoft brilliantly branded this mm -hmm. so it's really going in and helping you know devs and engineers figure out what needs to happen right um a um it's it's not quite going and replacing them so i'll give you an example right so the place where we are now focused on is called the process of triaging Okay, so when we sort of shorten the test suites for people, and you can sh shorten this by like, it's a risk-based approach. So depending on your level of risk appetite, you can replace this by, you know, 95%, you know, 30% to 95%, you choose. Okay? So what we found is um, people were doing that because they were trying to get to the failures so that they could understand where they need to focus, right? And so when we came in and looked at that and we said like, okay, so they are trying to triage things. Now, if you look at what's happening in the triage process is like, you know, I got 500 failures. I don't know if there's one issue underneath it. I'm kind of going through all the logs. I'm trying to figure this out. And then maybe after the fourth test failure, I kind of give up because human cognition can only take so much. But the real task I'm trying to determine is like, which failure should I focus on, which is giving me the most bang for the buck, right? And that triaging process still happens. Those humans are not going away, right? Um, so, so in that process, what AI, and we are doing that today, we probably release this in this quarter, is, is we go in and we say like, all right, you know, test 5, 10, 15, 25, all have failed because there's this one underlying issue underneath it. And then we can list out all the issues and by the number of failures. 
So you as a dev now go like, okay, all right. So if I fix issue five, I can knock out 100 tests of the 500 that are failing. And consequently, I can iterate fast. I can push things fast. So I truly believe that's sort of the world that we are headed towards where AI is augmenting you know, these workflows for people and making their life better and getting them to focus on the stuff that they should be doing, not going through sort of log files and correlating issues and figuring out which which one should I focus on. Right? Is, is part of, uh, so use it as a company, as you work with pros- prospective clients around this in your solution, mm-hmm. is there a like a, a cultural aspect of like, I don't know if you, uh, you know, is do this part of your review with any customers where you look at how are you actually what what's the culture of your of your development and testing uh, of the organization and whether they uh, do you, uh, maybe a broader question like do you see that there's certain you know uh, um, cultures types of the way that companies you know innovate that look for solutions like this that are, are you right. So yes, uh, there are cultural questions. So part of the cultural questions is if you are a startup, you naturally attract a set of people who are, you know, attuned to more risk taking, more, you know, uh, bought into this this change, like let's bring change, let's innovate and so on and so forth. So that's one. Um, lately, we've also seen uh, a set of people who were like, feeling left behind of all the innovations that have happened in maybe the last five or seven years. And they are trying to jump that whole thing and say mm-hmm. like, all right, we've moved fast. But the underlying emphasis still remains where the you know the company itself is looking at innovation and trying to get there. Um, um, then they're very, you know, since this is a you know, technical audience, it's very simple flags that we have, right? one of the flags we have is like if you're still doing manual testing you're likely you know we are not likely the solution for you Mm -hmm. um because you know you have to go through the journey of automating stuff and like where machine learning and ai comes in is like it looks at data and the data typically gets you know generated when you have stuff automated and you're running stuff and, and so on um you know, we've, in the early days, we had like some customers come in and said, like, we run this test suite once every month just before the release. And they're like, no, you probably need to think about that. So that's, yeah, those are sort of the things that we try to fly. Down. Yeah, I, it just made me think of, I've worked with a number of clients where what, what happened, because I, I could just see this, is that they've they've hired a new CIO or a new CTO that's worked in some of those most more advanced. And so wants to jump mm-hmm. steps in this, this process. And, and, and what usually fails is that they'll like, they get it, they get where they should be, but they're, yeah. they're not taking the necessary steps not all the time. Some do that. They understand the challenge of, Hey, we need to move the company to a place where we then could take advantage of this technology yeah, jumping through steps and helping the organization get to the point, it generally leads to like that CTO moving on after spending a lot of money, spending a lot of time and yeah. not making the necessary change. It goes back to, again, that the hardest part of changing an organization is the people aspect of that. And yeah. it, it, so that's why I asked about like the, you know, culturally, if you have those conversations, like I'm a yeah, big so, advocate for like the maturity model, like that concept of like helping a client understand this is where you are today in these different categories. Like this is the reality of where you are. You want to be up at this like CMM level five, but you can't bypass these other steps. There's just things that you need to do, things you need to learn and process in, in place to be able to get to that point, regardless yeah. of the size of an organization. So I completely buy the point that you're making. Um, for us, the reality as a startup is what you tend to do is say, hmm, educating a customer and walking them down this journey is likely not, you know, a way a startup will succeed. It's, you know, if I was at CloudVees today or I was at Atlassian today, this is something that I would do and take them on the journey and say, let me throw some PS at you. So as a startup, you tend to take 
a different approach. So the approach that we did was to say is like, look, what we can do is if you were leaning, you know, forward leaning enough and we've had some customers come in, they were like, we just, I just came in as a CTO and like tests are kind of going bonker. They're adding like a lot of friction to me, my delivery process. How can you help? And we go like, all right, there's pretty much four lines of changes to your CI script to send data to us and learn, right? We learn, you just connect to us. We'll spend a couple of weeks learning and then we'll come back to you and say like, well, if you now, you know, choose this risk, you can cut down your cycle time by 80%, right? And then there are organizations that go like, huh, that is pretty cool. Like, let me try this out. And then it kind of goes through that process and we that's how we circumvent it um, and get to them. Now, the other part that you call out is also interesting is like maybe the, the CTO is leaning forward, leaning enough, but the person on the ground isn't because he is or she is pretty old school, right? And then we naturally find that, well, we kind of hit the culture, cultural, cultural, uh, you know, what's the things, you know, quicksand where things don't move fast enough. Right. right? And then, then we are trying to identify is, can we get somebody else who, who is forward leaning and within that organization and kind of do that. And you often find the people who are passionate enough to kind of do that because it's a problem and they are willing to sort of lean in and do it. But so we, we solve this from a product perspective, mm -hmm. just like, let me make it easy for you. Well, I know that with with uh, you know one of the the conversations that's happening around AI and ML now is just the rate of change, how mm -hmm. fast. I mean, everything is is has been brought on. Um, that's why I really appreciate. Again, if somebody who has focused so much of my career over the last thirty years on governance, on IT governance, and specifically you know collaboration, information management system governance. Um, and security, obviously, security compliance and governance are all partnered within that, um, is how fast the technology is happening. A lot of people that have very valid concerns, like um, uh, around, are, are we, you know, if we take this risk, because you, you, you used the word, you, you said, if you're willing to take on this level of risk, you could reduce it by this, this amount. Um, making changes quickly i mean is there uh, what kind of risks are involved in that yeah so uh, so the way to think about this is sres do this right so they have like this notion of like seeing okay there's a there's something that's coming in what's the risk to the system right? so effectively what we are calling out it's a uh, what i meant by a risk based approach is you say okay um i want 90% confidence in my you know test execution yeah um, and I'm willing to, you know, get it down to like, say a few minutes, right? And if, if I do that, making a hypothetical scenario, so let's say I was able to reduce my test cycle uh, time from like an hour to five minutes, I can actually put this in my pull request process. So my pull requests are much more baked before I do any downstream impact. Today, I can only do downstream impact. So that risk-based thinking actually brings the risk way earlier into your cycle, such that later on points are much, much, you know, more stable. Um, and then there is a valid concern is like, well, what if I'm not willing to do that? And our usual answer is like, you know, what you are, what you care about is like, I want to know whether a set of changes are going to break production, right? We'll flag that for you. And then you run your entire test suite at some point in your cycle, right? That test suite that take, takes, like I was just talking to somebody, it takes 24 hours for them to run, right? So they can only run it like once a week or something like that. Now you're running that hourly and running like, you know, finding all these signals. And then you're still running that one entire giant run. So you effectively did not introduce any more risk. You found signals way, way earlier. So there's sort of nuances that just make this a, a very handy Swiss knife uh, to chop and, you know, look at your delivery process in very interesting ways and consequently get that feedback much faster. 
the last time I was in an operations role and working with support organizations, one of the, there was a, a clear disconnect between product and engineering and the support side of things. So there was the building of the technology and then there was mm -hmm. all of the capture of like what's going on with the customers then using these solutions and you know what the on the support side you know is all about you know how quickly can we solve these issues what's the how you know how long are these tickets open i mean these people were measured based on you yeah. know, the tickets so it's the mean time to resolution of these different issues and classifying those those issues and it felt like that data what they learned on the support side was not adequately translated over to the product teams and so it's a very very manual process i mean do you yeah is that kind of is that something that's that's happened over the last decade or do you see the future of more integrated across those various systems so i i see promises uh, and there's some organizations that are like you know uh, telling you that the customer success dashboard shows up and you're looking at like you know issues to perhaps Zendesk and feeding that back. Um, my experience has been that, yes, these tools help you flag these issues, but the process to flag that back to the engineering team, product team is still manual. Now, what has happened is product management as a function has really evolved as well. When I started as a product manager, there was no definition of a product manager, right? So we you know, went, went along and made it along. But now, like, you know, it's effectively a craft. And then, you know, part of your product management functionality of the product owner is looking at the customer data and the signals that your CS team is generating. And you are the stakeholder that brings that back to your, you know, agile sprint, right? So that's how the workflow works. Now, is that automatically coming back or like somebody is sitting in these conversations? I know like, you know, People on my team, I ask them to actually go in and sit in with CS calls and we are expected to run and attend some CS calls, not run, attend some CS calls mm -hmm. to get a firsthand, you know, view of a, of a pain point uh, versus just seeing a, a, a spreadsheet of, you know, problems. So there's like various ways that is done. One way our product has been used is people come back and say like, oh, you know what? Um, this is one of really big customers. One of their problems is like, all right, we need to push out a hot fix, right? And like, I need, really need to know whether this hot fix is going to make it or not. And guess what? You know, that naturally lends itself to like, can I predict which is what's going to fail? So like, let me get there. Right so, so yeah. tooling has a, a, a uh, tooling has evolved, roles have evolved, and and so on. So I think there's a lot that has been done in the last ten years. I know my in my experience, I think just what you've described is that there's the, there are some very proactive product managers. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've got friends now today that are like in that role that are very aware. They participate with operations and support and customer success teams that so they know like what the real world data is mm -hmm. around what's happening with the features, the products that they own. Uh, and I think the part of the problem, again, that, uh, my, I see it, maybe you have a different perspective, but my, I get that large companies that will, like you use this exact scenario of large company that need, that had a problem with something or other, we need to do a hot fix around that issue. But the long tail of small customers, yeah, I mean, I get that. That's a massive customer paying a big bill for their for your products. Mm -hmm. But the long tail of clients, the data might show that that's a much smaller issue for the majority of, of clients that could be missed. I mean, uh, my personal experience was um, being the liaison with the product team that, again, it was sometimes trying to get them to listen, like, let, this is our pain again and again and again and again. We need mm -hmm. to have this this fixed, um, e even though usually those pains won't drive new licensing, won't expand the size of a, that a customer pays, you know, all the things that the business cares about. But, um, you know, they would only react when operations and support cost exceeded not taking action kind of things. Yeah. But again, but that's another, that's, that's why it's so important to look at data 
from those different right. systems into that. That's just a different data point in your overall exactly development right. life cycle. Now, now the, the the story that you took right you, uh, the underlying presumption is a hot fix is related to a particular customer it might just be like well authentication layer just completely broke on this particular platform and then it causes problems to x amount of customers right so there's a different flavor as well and what i've seen you know organizations do and certainly minded when i was at atlassian was um, there is a certain amount of uh, um, in your agile sprint, certain amount of time that's allocated to burning down technical debt and fixing customer issues. Right? And you try to hold a certain line, maybe like 30%, you know, like 30% you know, is unpredictable, 30% on new product features, whatever that works for that organization at that particular point in time. And sort of looping back to the agility process that we talked about, then you go about changing it along the way. Like if like none of the customers are happy, then perhaps you know it's time to move that you know hundred percent to customer success versus um, as long as you're aware of that and you're not ossified into like you know this this is our you know thirty percent thirty percent thirty percent is how we work. Right. I think that's what's needed in the organization. Well, again, it goes back to. I'm, as I said at the beginning, it goes back to the the culture of your develop of development of, of how you innovate at the company, and um, I, you have to have a holistic view. You, you can't stop listening to each of those different channels, right. those different different groups, um, yeah. and you have to be more flexible. But it so that's where again it's something that I do in my work as a consultant and working with organizations around change management is to recognize that they have become siloed. They have become, yeah. you know, blind to these other areas and things that they need to do. That's, I don't realize that's a, I'm very passionate on that topic. In fact, I just, you're talking about digital debt. I just wrote a couple articles this last month on that topic mm. and you know, what organizations need to do. But I am interested, like getting your view, given what your company does and in this space, like what we're in, I think I started asking this question with, the rate of change of growth of, of innovation around AI and ML, where do you think it's going? Like, what do, what do you think like the, the near future of the space looks? <laughs> I think this is a really hard question. So I'll, I'll sort of contrast with what's actually happening with customers on the ground, right? So when I started the company four years, four and a half years back, part of my thinking was like, I've been in organizations where I said like, let's, let's, you know, incorporate AI. And we were like, no, this is too far in the future. So I said like, you know what? I strongly believe in this. I'm going to go build an AI company. And the first few years where I pitched this, I would get prospects coming in and saying like, AI, we don't quite believe in, you know, AI. I think we can do a better job of this and so on. And when the chat GPT switch got turned on, now you're not that engineering person who comes and says, I don't believe in AI, right? You can't afford to do that. So in a short period of a year, like the entire market has flipped, at least from adopting and the willingness to adopt. Now, I think the challenge in the enterprise B2B space is going to be actually figuring out what are the right use cases to build. So um, I think we are not there yet. So people are still thinking, we'll sprint, you know what? Everybody's talking about AI. Now I cringe saying I'm an AI machine learning company because you know what? Everybody sprinkled an AI machine learning pixie dust on top. Right. And you're like, all right, this is AI now. And people haven't spent, aren't spending enough time figuring out what is the use case that we are trying to fix and why are we fixing that with AI? And like, that's how, you know, um, I think that's where we are going to be. So what I think is going to happen in the next year or two is everybody is trying to get a handle on this AI stuff. And they're going to like come back to this place and say like, okay, how does AI truly help my customer in this particular use case? And I'm intentionally separating the, you know, the chat GPTs and the anthropics of the world because that's a completely different use case and that's a completely sort of different industry that's coming up. But how is AI changing my DevOps transformation? How is it helping me in the DevOps transformation? It's likely going to be a pointed approach like logical. It's like, okay, 
you know, there's friction, there's a dev test workflow friction. And you know what, we can use Gen AI and LLMs to help you intelligently figure out whether friction caused a problem or the code caused a problem or the QA team caused a problem or the infra caused a problem. And that's sort of the level of thinking that needs to happen. And I'm, I think is happening in a number of organizations. I, I think that's great advice. I, I, it's when I talk to companies that I, I get asked the similar question, and I said, you know, what, you need to be in there piloting. You need to be trying things. Because uh, you know, right now, we, we don't know fully how it may change and evolve rapidly. Um, it, it, there could be industry-specific solutions and outputs. Right. I mean, I would say just based on, on here, the last five minutes of the conversation, I'd say you know, AI being able to go and look at your operation support data and helping triage and prioritize that and then blending that with what's happening on the development side is an area that a business may want to go and experiment, try some things. Exactly. There. Right. So the so I'll I'll go back to the product and make this point, right? So we when we looked at this, we were like, when I started off with, I had a vision that I could go in and help you figure out what these underlying test failures are, classify them, you know, route them to people. And but the tech didn't exist, right? So we started off with the you know, the problem that I've really talked about is how do I reduce the test cycle time? And now AI is there and we can actually sort of use Gen AI and LLMs to kind of go do that for you. I think the the other thing that engineering leaders need to think about, and I, I think is a personal event more than anything, I don't think it will happen, is people go in and go like, okay, I have, you know, a, my own kingdom to build. Let me go figure out how I'm going to build what say launchable is building or anybody else in the space is building and get that in there the big classic build versus buy problem mm -hmm. and i think where you need to be is like you know there are companies that are focused on building this stuff they're looking at this data they are focused on this let's just bring that in see how we improve our workflow right and like you you brought an ai to help your workflow you're not sort of going and solving and building an AI solution internally to solve for the problem. You know what I mean? Yeah. You just don't go about building your own solution because you know running an AI system takes time and effort. Go solve the problem that impacts your stakeholders and just you know assemble them from off-the-shelf tools. You still AI-fied your pipeline and you got like way more bang for the buck than if you spent like the next two years building and a launch of it. Internally. Exactly. Well, that, that's why, again, I, I say like, you know, you should be piloting. You should understand how the exactly. various tools, trialing things, understand. So one, when future solutions come, if you've already been in there playing with it, you know, you can call the bluff on where the marketing is leading what it actually does. You better understand that's not an area that's really going to impact our business. Yeah, You'll better understand how to adopt the future tech if you are in there playing with it and, and understand fundamentally how the technology works and how, uh, you know, and how your business runs. It's right. yeah. It, it, I, I always say that, uh, you know, I, I started my career as a business analyst. Uh, and one of the things I always say that so many of these complex problems really uh, are, they need to begin as a business analyst, somebody that understands the, the technology, the process, as so you keep using the word like the, for digital transformation, there's a big deal. It digital transformation is not about just upgrading to the newest technology. It's how to use the technology you have new and old to optimize what your business does. So your output is optimized using the technology that is um, digital transformation. And so much of that is that business analysts, like, looking at it from both the business and the technology side, and then figuring out how do we have, you know, what's the optimization of these two things? What needs to change in process? What needs to change in the technology side? And that's an ongoing, it's a, it's a moving target. But if you're in playing, it's like the housing market. If you're in there playing, you won't fall behind. Yeah. All right. I completely agree with you. Yes. I think that's very well said. It's very easy to soapbox on that topic, you know, <laughs> but 
Harpreet, I really appreciate your time. This is fascinating. Again, uh, you know, I'll have links out on the site and on, in the blog to, to go find out more about, uh, about Launchable. Definitely, folks, go check it out. And uh, I've got all of uh, Harpreet's contact information as well, so you can find out more. But Harpreet, really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcast, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening. Thank you.